I'm going to look at the detailed structure of the scalar triple product of some vectors. As its name suggests, it is 1. a scalar, that is a pure number, and 2. a product involving three vectors. Before looking at the details though, I want to ask the question, why would we bother? What's the point? Well, as is so often the case with the results involving vectors, the reasons for doing it are firmly rooted in geometry. To begin with, let me remind you of a result that I hope you already know something about. Here I've drawn a parallelogram whose sides are the vectors A and B. A cross B is the vector product of A and B. It is a new vector which is perpendicular to both A and to B. For example, if the parallelogram was in the plane of the table, then A cross B would point either vertically up out of the table or vertically down. With the orientation of A and B that I've chosen here, A cross B points vertically up. From a geometric point of view, the significance of A cross B is that its magnitude tells us the area of the parallelogram. And I want to make this more interesting. Imagine attaching four sloping sides to the four corners of the parallelogram. Let's give them the same direction and the same length, but be sloping out of the vertical. Can you imagine what that looks like? It's a bit like a sort of squashed box. The correct name for it, though, is that it's a parallelepiped. Here's a nice picture that someone's done for us. The parallelogram in the base is still formed from the vectors A and B, but now there's a sloping side C that slopes at an angle phi out of the vertical. I've marked in the area of the base as capital A. A cross B also still points to the vertical, so that means the angle between C and A cross B is phi. I've also written on the letter H. That stands for the height of the parallelepiped. Don't worry about that stuff to the left of H for the minute. Let's ask ourselves, what is H? Well, I hope it's not too hard to see. There is a right angle triangle there. I've put some dotted lines across the top there. Can you see that H must be the magnitude of C times the cosine of the angle, phi. Actually, that's just what's written to the left there of H by the person who did the diagram. It's just that some mathematicians like to use double bars for the magnitude of a vector. Well, the next thing I want to do is to ask about the volume of the parallelepiped. The volume is just the vertical height, H, multiplied by the base area, A. But we have expressions for those. H, we can already see sitting on the top of the page. A, do you remember, was magnitude of A cross B. So, if we multiply those things, we get magnitude of C times the magnitude of A cross B times the cos phi that's also in H. Magnitude of vector times magnitude of vector times cos of angle between. Does that ring a bell with you? It's just a scalar product, isn't it? In fact, it's the scalar product of C with A cross B. Scalar product is written with a dot, and it's a scalar. Since it involves three vectors, we call it the scalar triple product. Let's now investigate the details of this product. Let's give C, for example, some components. C1, C2, C3. And I'll assume that the same kind of thing works for A and B. So we can write down A cross B in the familiar way as a determinant. Do you remember that expression? I don't want to go into the details of working out a determinant, so I've just written down what you get. Don't be distressed by that plus that I've circled. Yes, I know that the J term should have a negative in front of it. But look at what I've done in the brackets. That ought to have been A1, B3 minus A3, B1, didn't it? When you work out the determinant. But I've swapped them, so that's introduced a second minus sign. All in all, the minuses 
compensate each other and the expression is correct. It now just remains to do C dot with this new vector. All that's going to happen is that we get C1 times the first component, C2 times the second and C3 times the third. I've written the C's over to the right. I've done that for a reason. Look at the expression on the bottom compared with the one in the middle of the page. The only difference seems to be that I has got swapped to a C1, J has got swapped to a C2, and K has got swapped to a C3. If that's the structure of the detailed expression for the scalar triple product, then there's no reason why we can't put that in at the beginning and put C1, C2, C3 in the determinant instead of I, J, K. So here now is the expression that everyone uses for the scalar triple product. The C's have replaced I, J and K. So there it is, that's the result we wanted. For the remaining minute or two of this recording I want to talk a little bit about the ordering of the vectors in the product. Determinants have well-known properties. One of them is that if you swap any pair of rows it introduces a minus sign. If we swap a pair of rows in the determinant, that's equivalent to swapping a pair of vectors in the product. Here's an example. I'm going to swap the first and second rows. That's equivalent to swapping A with C. There's the swap, but then remember I said that swapping rows in the determinant is equivalent to introducing a minus sign. So this thing is actually equal to minus C dot A cross B. Swapping any pair of vectors in the triple product introduces a minus sign. We now can do that without referring to the determinants at all. So here's an example. A dot B cross C must be the same as A dot and a minus C cross B, but that must be the same as minus B dot A cross C, and that must be the same as minus C dot B cross A, and so on. In every case, I have taken the first expression and swapped one or other pair of vectors. That always introduces a minus. Now the other thing we might do involves not swapping one row with another, but permuting the rows. Permuting means shuffling two of them up while the top one comes down to the bottom. So for example, if we start with C1, C2, C3, A1, A2, A3, B1, B2, B3. A permutation means, for example, moving the A's up to the top keeping the B's underneath and swapping the top row back down to the bottom. That's a permutation. What effect does this have? Well, in the vector product it's like cycling the vectors around. So we have on the left the first determinant was C dot a cross B, while the permutation has now turned it into A dot B cross C. It's like that C has been taken round to the position of the B and the A has been shuffled along and the B has been shuffled along. Now, are these things equal or is there a minus sign involved? Well, let's think about the swapping. The object on the right has A at the top, B in the middle and C at the bottom. It's the correct order in the alphabet. How do we get that from the expression in the red circle? Well, we want A on the top. So let's get it there by swapping it with C. A is now on top and that's introduced a minus sign. But it's not how we want it yet. A is on the top but C isn't yet on the bottom. 
you get C on the bottom, we have to remove it from its new position in the middle and swap it with B, so that B is now in the middle. That's a second swap, so it's another minus sign. OK, so that means that we've introduced two minus signs. We therefore have the result that permuting introduces two minuses and so it leaves the sign unchanged. The A swaps along to the left, B shuffles over to the left, and C comes off its starting point and goes to the end. A permutation of that kind doesn't change the sign. We could now do another one without using the determinants. We could move B along to the left, shift C along in the vector product, and shuffle A off to the end. If we then did another one, we'd get back where we started. OK, so to, in summary, in the triple product, that is the scalar triple product I'm talking about, a swap of two vectors introduces a negative one sign, but a permutation or a cyclic permutation, that is, leaves the sign unchanged. I could say a little more about this, but I'll leave you to experiment with it.